Um, uh, evening. So um, excited to welcome my good friend uh, Dan Lubetsky to our stage. Um, you all had when you came in had on your chairs kind bars, um, and you probably had one before uh, because thanks to Dan, they are literally everywhere. Um, and I'm sure you know Dan will tell you that he loves all his children equally. But but between you and me, like these dark chocolate and sea salt are far and away the best. They're amazing. <laughs> I've like I've I've done full triathlons just with these in my pocket, um, and um, you know trying them. You know if you haven't tried them, I think can probably tell you uh, better than we can convey from the stage uh, the power of the business that you know Dan has built. Um, it's um, you know today you know not only uh, is it you know the largest selling uh, food product on Amazon, doing more than a billion a year in, in, in sales, um, but truly redefined you know, this and, and created this category of, of you know, healthy snack foods with the transparent packaging and, and foods you can, uh, you know, ingredients you can see and pronounce. Um, and it's, it's really a testament to, to Dan's vision. Um, the, his story, uh, if, you know, and I will give you a shameless plug for his, his book, but. His story, if you you know you you haven't heard it um, and you didn't know it was true, uh, would would you know would be almost uh, fictional. The son of a Holocaust survivor grew up in Mexico City, uh, with a knack for entrepreneurship you got from your father and and a flair for performance I think is very much his own. Uh, he would hold uh, little carnival games uh, for siblings, for cousins, and charge a few pesos a pop. He uh, had a professional magician business uh, where he would perform at retirement homes and bar mitzvahs and performed actually at one of our dinner parties um, and now uh, at, at Carnegie Hall. Hopefully we can convince the, the, the great uh, who Danny, uh, which was his stage name to, to come out of retirement. Um, and uh, also had a watch business selling watches uh, in, in, in kiosks and a, a lawnmower business that you started without owning without lawnmower, a lawnmower. Yeah. which is good, good working capital management. And uh, the, you know the, the story of, of kind is is I think equally improbable. You know it began when he graduated from uh, Stanford Law School, turned down a offer at McKinsey, turned down an offer at Sullivan and Cromwell, and went to the Middle East with this vision of building bridges and fostering you know peace um, among you know uh, different communities in a war torn, conflict torn region. Uh, by building businesses uh, where people could collaborate, and, and thus was born PeaceWorks um, and later Kind, and you know, in, in so many ways the rest is history. Um, and it, it's, it's quite a big business now, but it really began just here on the streets of New York, like literally right outside, with Dan going up and down Broadway, knocking on doors, you know, from bodega to Zabar's, uh, and really just cold calling on people uh, with what at that time was a sun-dried tomato paste, I think, um, and. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's really quite a remarkable journey, and it, it speaks in, in so many ways to the force of his personality. I'll just tell you one story. So Jen and I, when we originally got to know him, uh, we were at dinner uh, with, um, uh, it was Jen and me and uh, Dan and Mich his, his amazing wife, Michelle. We have many things in common. I think marrying above our station is, is one of them. And we were out after theater, and we were at Orso, which is this restaurant everybody goes to after theater. And sitting next to us is like the whole SNL cast. And I'm, of course, Jen and I are doing that thing where we like we pretend we're way too cool for this, like the New York thing, and we're like ignoring them. And of course, Dan gets up, goes over, sits down with them. I have no idea what he's saying. Pretty soon, the whole SNL cast is laughing, and he's he's walking around the restaurant handing out kind bars. Um, <laughs> and I like I can't tell you how many times I've been in a situation where I walk into a store with Dan and there are no kind bars at the checkout counter, and I come back the next day and there are kind bars. It is some version of magic that he learned at a young age. Um, you know, I joked with Dan that, that, that you know, peace in the Middle East, probably the world's worst business plan, but he, um, you know, one of the amazing things about kind is uh, the extent to which he was able to build a business uh, whose very foundation, you know, was built on the idea of a positive social mission. Of, of building bridges and bringing people together, and where he was able to scale that business without compromising growth, without compromising the interests of the business, 
um, and, and, and with true fidelity, authentic fidelity to that, that, that vision and that mission. And he really stands for the proposition that I think you can build a business um, and do some good at the same time, which is something you know we talk a lot about at Standard. So we're excited. Thank you for being here with us. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, Thank you so much. You <laughs> like don't, I can't. Uh, I can't so, stop that. So I'm, I'm really, I'm interested in, um, you know, when you started Kind, uh, the idea of a mission-driven business was um, not, you know, as common as it is today. It is now the received wisdom. You have the, you know, you have the um, the business roundtable coming out and said we need to consider all stakeholders. You have, you know, people like BlackRock, you know, saying companies need to be, you know, need to consider their social responsibility, and businesses lead with that in, in many ways. Um, but, you know, you said something very interesting, which is the mission doesn't sell the product, the product sells the product. So I'm curious, actually, what you see as the limitations of a mission-driven business and the, some of the pitfalls you could make in a mission-driven business, even if you want to be, you know, true and authentic to that, that mission. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. And I love Jennifer and David, and I learned so much from them, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here with you guys, particularly because David asked me to do a magic trick or a couple of magic things at the end, and I'm really excited that after tonight, I can say that I've performed magic at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> so, and to the Carnegie Hall Hall organizers, Amy was walking me out the elevator, and I said that, if I could say that, I was joking. She's like, well, you technically can't. I'm like, I promise I won't do that. It was just a joke. <laughs> but even before Kind, when PeaceWork was, was born 10 years before, that's when really there was no language being used for what today we call social entrepreneurship, uh, compassionate capitalism, conscious capitalism. There's all this terminology back in 1993, 94, when Peace Workers was born, that didn't exist. And so I coined the term not only for profits, because there's not for profits, there's for profits, and there's a missing space for a lot of businesses that wanna make money and have a social impact. And for me, the transition from Peace Works to Kind was very obvious, because once I did Peace Works and I was making money while bringing neighbors together, and I didn't make that much money, uh, kind sells more in one day than PeaceWorks sells in an entire year. So PeaceWorks was and still is a very modest business, but the concept of it to use business as a force for bringing together made me fall in love with the possibility of channeling market forces to try to drive impact in society, to solve problems in a sustainable and scalable way. So not everything can be solved through business, but when you can use market forces to do so, it flows better, you don't have to raise money. Because I also do a lot of charitable stuff and raise funds for organizations I started or for others, and it's hard every year having to ask money. So if you're able to build into your, your business model a way to have impact, I think it, it, it's really magical. And limitations, before we talk about limitations, let's say about qualifiers or requirements, the most important requirement is authenticity. So. I think there's companies that make money and produce products or goods that are not necessarily gonna change the world, but they are products or goods that people, or, or services that people want. And as long as they manage themselves with integrity, I think net-net business is a very positive element in society, and we should be very proud of, because it generates jobs, it generates um, pride, when people work for something that they care about. It's a very important fundamental obligation of society to be able to provide people with their sustenance and with the products and services that they want. So net-net, if you're doing no other harm, I think you're already doing great for society. You maybe go one rung below if you are producing things that are poisoning people or things that are harming um, children or products that are actually not good for you or harmful. But other than that, I think that, that that's already something to be praising. And where it becomes a creative, where you can elevate it, is when you can take a business model to drive change. Or I think more and more what I think is how you do business. Because how you do business is, I, I've come to conclude, is more important than what you're aiming to do. It's, it's the journey 
that matters so much more because if you have an aspiration to do something uh, meaningful, but the way you're doing it, you're cutting corners or not treating people with dignity, I, I think a lot of us lose sight of the importance of every single interaction. <clears throat> and I've been thinking lately of an interaction I had with a person years ago that was had a mission and an organization that he led that was of enormous importance. All of you here have heard of this person. And the work he aims to do is important and meaningful. But then he and I sat down for dinner and he was so nasty with the waiter. He was just really, really unnecessarily mean. Mm. And it just struck me like, wow, you know, this person is trying to change the world but every single day with interactions like that is changing it for the worse. And I think, I think it's very important that we not take ourselves so seriously that we think that the ends justify the means. And I think the opposite, if you're building a company, whatever it may be, and in the culture that you build, you're treating each other with respect and with integrity and, and with kindness and working as a team and, and honoring your word, I think that goes a long way. And then the next level is where you can cook it into your business model, but it has to be authentic. And so the limitations are, first of all, when it's not authentic, when, when uh, what you're doing is just a gimmick, because it doesn't just hurt your business where people don't, people have a sixth sense of sophistication with brands, and if they feel that it's a gimmick, they will, they will snuff it out, and it probably will castigate the brand for that. And, it also hurts society overall because we become more cynical. We live in a society where cynicism is, is almost greater than trust in, because of necessity, because we get so over-marketed. So um, the other, there's so many other limitations. One of the other limitations is your own lifestyle. When you believe in something so passionately that you think that you're advancing a greater good, the positive of that is that you're going to be almost unstoppable. The negative is that sometimes you don't take care about other things you need to take care about. Like when I was starting PeaceWorks and I was starting, I didn't have much of a life. I was just working so hard. And um, I lived in a studio apartment. And, you know, my, my first... Should I stop talking and let you... <laughs> no, no, go, go. <laughs> I'll stop talking. Did you, I mean, did you ever... <laughs> You're like, thank you very much. And now the magic. Um, did, did, did you ever feel you, you, you know, I mean, at some juncture, you, you know, you've talked about your, your and philosophy and maybe share it with the, you know, the, the, the group, but did you ever feel there was some critical juncture in the growth of the business where you really felt you had to choose between, um, the mission and the interests of the business? At kind, you mean? Yeah. The deepest question, the deepest answer to your thing is, because the, the, the e easier answer is that, relatively speaking, no, because we chose to make healthy snacks, and every time somebody eats a kind bar over one of our competitors' products, they're consuming much less empty calories and more nutritionally dense products. And so by the choices we made at the beginning in our model, I think those tensions decrease. And there are, for tensions here or there, but fundamentally, I think we've chosen the right path. But I think the most honest and deepest answer that is reflective of our society is that I think all of us as human beings rationalize things to make them consistent with our philosophy, with our allegiances, with our choices. So if you, I'm gonna not get political or anything here, if you voted for Trump, you, will construct a way to justify why you voted for him, and if you're a senator in the Republican Senate against all the evidence that you see, you will construct an answer for how you're not undermining democracy. You are actually saving democracy from socialism, and you're saving democracy from uh, the suffocation of the far left with all their identity politics. And you. And by the way, these issues may be valid on the other side, which gives them the sense of, uh, of, of righteousness. But the problem is that all of us as human beings do this. So I am certain. I think that by the choices I made, I have less of those compromises. But I am certain that 
I find a way to rationalize my choices mm -hmm. to make them consistent with, with this interest. And it's very hard for all of us as human beings to be more self-critical and to take information and acknowledge that sometimes we may be wrong or acknowledge that some of our choices have those pressures. And it, it's important for all of us to, to be more self-reflective. And, you know, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go into the politics and then okay. I can get out for a second. <laughs> But I, I was born in Mexico City to the son, I was the son of a Holocaust survivor. And so for me, I do not take democracy and rule of law for granted. When I came to the United States, talking about rationalization, I would never criticize the US president for many, many years. Uh, and when somebody would criticize the president, it scared me and bothered me. And I would tell them, you know, how can you be so disrespectful? Because I had been taught in Mexico that you don't criticize your head of state. But the truth is you don't criticize your head of state in the 1970s or 80s in Mexico because you're going to get in jail. And rather than acknowledging that suppression and fighting that suppression, most of us in Mexico just said, well, it's just not right to criticize the president is just disrespectful, but it's not. It's one of the greatest strengths of the American system that we can criticize whoever we want and not suffer the consequences of being honest about our beliefs. But in today's day and age in the United States, the way Trump has taken step after step after step, the entire Republican establishment is terrified of him. And there's a lot of senators and Congress people that quietly will tell you that they're terrified, but they cannot oppose him because they'll get primaried or this or that or that. And this has only been three years. And so I think it's a very serious time for us where the far left and the nativist right and everybody in the center needs to ask ourselves the question, do we cherish enough these incredible gifts that we've been given by our forefathers to defend them and to uphold them and to fight harder for them? Because the far left that's pushing so left is only gonna push the far right and vice versa. And the vast majority of people that are moderates, while the extremists wake up in the morning and think, you know, how am I gonna advance my cause? The moderates wake up in the morning and think, what am I gonna have for breakfast? And when you think that way, you let these guys hijack it. So all of us in this room have to understand that there's a very important role to play in defending our democracy and our rule of law. And if we don't find that shame on us and if in the next generation we lose it, I'm telling you it's happening faster than we realize. It's only been three and a half years. And the erosion of trust in our institutions, in the free press, in Congress, in the judiciary, is happening so much faster. And with social media tools, it's a very serious time. So I urge all of you guys to find a way to, to get involved. In, in, in defending that. I want to talk about building the brand, but be, while we're on politics, did you ever feel like as a business leader, you know, and, and having a, you know, kind of a responsibility to your team, your employees, that you couldn't speak out or you couldn't? All the time, yeah. all the time, all the time. I'm like, like I just got, um, man, I have so many funny stories to tell you, hmm. but uh, I just got a, a Twitter feed happening a couple days ago where, a Bernie Sanders supporter put on the Twitter, and he, a, a significant one that has a, a very huge following, wrote, did you realize that the founder of Kind, his, his name is Daniel Lubetsky, is a billionaire, and that he supported, gave money to Pete Buttigieg? We should boycott him and the Kind bars. And there's like 500 comments in that <laughs> group saying, yeah, you know, down with the capitalists, down with Buttigieg supporters. And if you read the comments, it's terrifying because it shows such lack of self-reflection. Nobody took a minute to look at my background about how I got my success. Nobody took a minute to look at what I do with my money, how I fight for, for these things. And it's just, it's, it's, it's true that at some point, you know, you do have to worry about those issues, but for me, being the son of a Holocaust survi survivor, the weight on me to prevent what happened to my father from happening again is so overwhelming that it makes me say what I need to say and 
get my priorities straight about what is the most important thing. Yeah. This, this, this is the problem with the Democrats right now is that they are spending their time trying to figure out how to boycott kind bars. Not, um, not <laughs> the overwhelming majority are not doing it. The overwhelming majority are grateful for kind bars and they tell me that they ate them on the campaign trails on all the <laughs> candidates. The and I, and I, I'm sure Bernie Sanders himself would castigate that uh, way of thinking. But, but this uh, mob, mob, mob mentality, not mob, this mob mentality is a, it's a problem for all of us. So um, now let's talk a bit, little bit about sort of the, the building the brand because you know, one of the people who, who sat here and had a conversation with us recently was um, Eric Reese who wrote The Lean Startup and he's sort of the prophet of this idea of minimum viable product and fail fast and just go out and test stuff and if it blows up. And you talk about a brand being you know, promise you know, or, and a promise kept and you know, very similar to our business, right? There's huge risk to going out with a you know a product that is not um, fully formed, right? That doesn't deliver on the promises of your brand, right? Yeah. So how do you deal with that question of kind of innovating? And it's great for the tech community to say we innovate and we exactly. just we just keep failing, 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 but. If you fail or, or, or if we fail, it's, it has much I higher consequences. How, how I, do you I don't know Eric, and I'm sure he has some very valid points. My experience in the consumer product goods space, and particularly in the food world, is, like I said, and I other stuff said, a brand is a promise, and a great brand is a promise well kept. And the thought that I could fail fast and risk my brand is unfathomable. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put a product out there that I don't feel comfortable that when people experience it, it will exceed their expectations. First, of course, there's an issue of health and safety, so you cannot cut corners there. But then also just in terms of keeping the kind promise, like whenever you try a kind product, we always want to make sure that it does the kind thing for your body by being helpful, always leading with nutrient-dense ingredients. Always do the kind thing for your body, by, for your taste buds by being tasty, and always do the kind thing for the world by the way we do it, inspiring kindness and through our mission. And, and for us, it's very important that we be true to that. And we don't want to risk that. And um, it is true that in the tech world, you're, you can test and do A-B testing, and that's all really um, fashionable and, and true. But in the consumer product goods world, I think you need to test things quietly you need to get it right, you need to make sure that it's right, and yes, you can do some testing quietly, but when you're gonna roll out your product, you can't afford to fail because, you know, if you launch a product that disappoints people, they're not just gonna stop eating that product, they're gonna stop eating everything in your brand because they kind of betrayed me. It, the trust that comes into a brand is so deep and important, and. And if you take advantage of that, as I did when I was at PeaceWorks, when I was at PeaceWorks and I was a uh, overly excited 27 or 28 year old uh, in my second or third year, and our first products did fine and they were good and they were very high quality, and people told me, you know, the way you grow is you just get more shelf space. So I went from three delicious spreads that were sun-dried tomato, basil pesto, olive pesto, into seven spreads. Uh, well, wait till the punchline. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they're like, oh, some dried tomato. Wait, that was the serious part. <laughs> um, but then I, then I added, you know, more items. And then we're like, Daniel, just get more shelf space. And I was so hungry and, I, and so naive that I'm like, okay, I'm going to try other things. And we started coming up with things. We're running out of ideas. I promise you this is true. We came up with a sweet and spicy teriyaki pepper spread made by Arabs and Israelis. <laughs> and like... <laughs> Why the hell would someone trust a brand made in the Mediterranean with a sweet and spicy teriyaki pepper spread? So the, the but first, the worst part... The, yeah, the, the first, first teriyaki pepper. ever made by Israelis. And, and, and the worst was the execution. It wasn't even good. It was this gelatinous blob. <laughs> and I knew it in my gut that it was not living up to the promise. But I told myself, okay, you know, maybe somebody will like it. <laughs> and we put it on the shelves. Along with, we went from three items to seven items to 16 items. And initially, my sales soared because I got all the distribution. And then my sales tanked. Because the person that trusted me that I had given the sundry tomato spread 
delicious. And the basil, delicious. And the olive, delicious. And then I abused their trust. I gave them, I abused their trust. They were trusting me to take care of them. My brand was supposed to be an arbiter of taste. And I delivered them that gelatinous thing. And they're like, forget you. I'm not buying any of your products again. That's how consumers operate. That's how brands operate. So you have an enormous responsibility to be a brand guardian and protect your yeah. brand. And, and, and you'd learn that. I mean, when you got to Kind, right, and, and founded Kind, you, you would sort of learn that lesson. I, I mean, I think there was a moment you talk about where you were being pushed to expand the product line beyond the original, and I think some of your top team actually quit over your refusal. Over not, yeah, right, yeah right. over your refusal to 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 expand quicker than you thought you could. Slightly more, they quit because they were smart. <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing. We just got lucky at the end. But but you're talking about yeah. kind was. I'm slightly joking, but but only slightly. Uh, <laughs> we had like seven or eight or nine people, and. Kind bars started taking off. But remember, prior to Kind, Peace Rocks had been 10 years of two steps forward, two steps back, a lot of mistakes, barely surviving. And then right before Kind got launched, our worst experience was one item that we were importing, the uh, manufacturer changed the ingredients and we didn't have control over that, which is what we decided to ne resolve never to allow again, that we would control our fate. But basically, we lost all of our business. And after 10 years of this journey, I was really uh, drained and frankly, at some point depressed. And we went around the table and saw, said, should we try this thing with kind or not? And some of us considered going back to other jobs and closing PeaceWorks because of these experiences. And we said, all right, let's, let's launch kind. I, I'm not exaggerating. Kind was born out of one of the darkest periods both financially and in my life because my dad passed away in 2003 and that was the year that we were conceiving this and just to think that I was this close to giving up and to not trying I was this far away from saying knocking on the door of a, one of my friends companies saying, hey you know I have all these other skills it's let me go work with you I was this far away from just giving up and we said all right let's try it again the, we have this concept for kind let's launch it and kind just took off and then what you're alluding to in the period is, as it took off one or two years later, all the brokers are knocking on the door, give us more products, give us more products. And we said, no, we're gonna stay focused. And it's at this time that some of my most talented team members say, there you go again. The brokers are telling you to uh, diversify and to expand, and you wanna just stay focused. We need to expand, we're leaving. And, and, we, and I had really talented team members leave, and I don't fault them because I had a background where where I hadn't had that success, but the joke's on them. <laughs> because then kind of just totally took off. And yeah. every one of those three team members would have made 20 to $40 million wow. today if, because the people that stayed yeah. did very well for that's, themselves. That's amazing. So you, you learned the lesson about being disciplined and protecting the brand and protecting that promise. So but in that framework, is there- Because just to clarify, every person that's joined that kind is a stockholder in kind. So everybody receives a, a, a small amount of stock options, but back then the people that were the, at the founding stock members, that stock exploded. If you come today, it's a different situation, but sorry that I interrupted. And amazingly, I mean, you're, you're very modest, but you also brought along all the original investors in PeaceWorks too, which you know you technically did not have to do, so. Which you can talk to, but I don't uh -huh. want to disturb. But um, so, you know, is, is, is you think, but, but you ultimately get to a point where you have to innovate, you have to expand the brand somehow, even, even keeping it, you know, even in keeping with the promise you make, right? And, you know, are there any tricks you found when you have now a company that has a great brand and a great product, and you're thinking about, you know, moving it forward in the right way, um, to, to, to figure out how to do that as, as you yeah. have begun to, to diversify into related products? Well, it remains to be seen five or 10 years from now if we're doing it right now, right? Because only in retrospect you're gonna see it. But our intention and our, what we do to help us is we have very clear guardrails. So we have something called the kind promise and everybody can go on the web and read what our kind promise is. And the number one promise in our kind promise is that every product we make will lead with nutrient-dense, whole 
foods recommended for daily consumption by the dietary guidelines. It's a mouthful, but everything we make is nutritious. And in case you're like, yeah, what's the big deal? There is no other snack company in the world at our scale that can make that kind of promise. Why? Because if you put refined sugars or refined flours in your product as your first ingredient, you can lower the cost because refined flours or sugars are 25 to 37 cents a pound. Whole almonds are three to six dollars a pound, uh, three to five dollars. I'm talking in the industrial, uh, you know, when you buy in, 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 in tons. Uh, we buy 2% of the world's almonds today. And so we get the best prices. And even then, you know, it's 10x more than refined sugars or flours. So consequently, most of the industry is dominated by products that lead with empty calories, refined flours or sugars. So about 50% of consumer product goods that you buy today lead with some form of sugar. Uh, and we're paying for it at the hospital. The rise of an inflammatory disease, even as we're conquering infectious diseases, inflammatory diseases which are strongly correlated with how we eat are just exploding. And so for us, that's the most important kind of promise. And then there's like several other kind of promises that will only use a modicum of sugar, that will have less sugar than our competing items, that will only use a modicum necessary to, to achieve the right balance between health and taste, that we will not ever use artificial sugars, artificial sweeteners, uh, synthetic ingredients, no synthetic dyes, no artificial colors, no uh, sugar alcohols. There's a whole set of promises, and that helps us just stay true to, to our brand. And I think uh, that helps you provide the guardrails. But even then, there's a lot of pitfalls because then, you know, how fast do you advance? And do you want to, you have ideas, like we had an idea for creating um, an ice cream product that would be very, very uh, much better nutritional mm -hmm. benefits. And we got beaten to it. Others came up with that first. And so you could say, well, you should have gone faster. But on the other side, you know, if you expand too fast, I think my other philosophy, David, is that you need to make sure first and foremost, that you're protecting your anchor products. You don't have permission to expand unless you're winning in your current areas. Because for me, the best analogy is a game called Risk that I played as a kid, that it's kind of like a world, uh, world domination game. Mm. <laughs> but it's, it's like, you have, you're battling for, the, have you played Risk? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure you've like, yeah, not with that voice. Track business success based on whether you played Risk or Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> is that how you like, know? Like, Dungeons and Dragons is the tech world and Risk is like the rest of the world. You'll teach me the Dungeons yeah. and Dragons analogy, but the Risk analogy is that if you expand too fast, then somebody else is gonna beat you at it. Every morning, someone's waking up trying to take your lunch away. Somebody, it's an efficient marketplace. So in whatever place in the store that you're competing or in standard industry, in any of the industries you are, somebody's competing with you. And if you expand so widely, trying to be everything to everyone, eventually you become so weak and that you become nothing to nobody. And so you need to make sure that you defend your core and expand without weakening that core. Yeah. So, you know, you talked about that, that moment and how dark it was when you, when you started Kind. And you know, I think you said, I love this quote, that, that you know, most people look at a glass and see whether it's half full or half empty. And an entrepreneur, you know, you, you know, looks at it and just fills up the glass. Um, so what are, you know, what are some of the qualities that kind of make for a good entrepreneur, a good businessman that, that, that you see or look for, see in yourself? And can they be taught? I think you can create a culture and an environment that prices some of those traits. Mm -hmm. Some people are born more than others with that risk tolerance and, and all that, but I think what we do at KIND, it's not just that we have people are stock owners, is that we create an ownership mentality where the decisions we take, we try, we strive. I'm sure that some people might complain that we don't always do it perfectly, but we strive to empower our team members to question things and to come up with their ideas and to decrease the hierarchy. And every three months, I used to meet everybody that joined. Now we, 
I don't initially, so every three months, I meet everybody that joined over the last quarter, and I talk to them, and one of the things that I implore them is to make sure that they, from day one, are comfortable having a critical eye and observing things that all of us that have been there already for a while might not observe, and, and make sure that if you notice something is wrong, don't be scared about going to someone you report to, and if that person doesn't get it, go, you know, I mean, I guess I don't wanna encourage uh, people to ignore who they report to, but in general, <laughs> I try, I wanna get people to feel comfortable noticing if we could do things better. And I think creating that culture where you celebrate resourcefulness and entrepreneurialism, uh, and, and there's thousands of ways in which you can do, you know, we, we publish our values, we talk about our values, we try to model them, we try to provide examples. Um, I think in our society overall, and in our businesses, a culture of hearty debate and disagreement is very important. What's happening on college campuses today where if you have an opinion that's different from what's the right thing to say, you're gonna get ostracized, is very dangerous because then the, the marketplace of ideas is gonna be filtered. And I've been at companies where people that I respect a lot and I go to their companies and I notice that their staff just says what their founder or CEO wants to hear. And you can mark that as the moment where those companies are gonna become mediocre because it's like the emperor with no clothes, right? You're gonna eventually not be able to compete. You're gonna be outcompeted. So I'm, a, as you can tell, a passionate Mexican Jew. So I, uh, I, I share what I believe, but if in a meeting somebody disagrees with me and I make my point forcefully, I almost always make sure to point out that the most valuable team member at that meeting was the person that disagreed with me. Yeah. Whether they won debate or not, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But we need to encourage people, not just for the sake of talking, guys, please, Jennifer, don't do that with David. No. <laughs> uh, David, don't do it with Jennifer. <laughs> uh, but it's not, not just for the sake of, of uh, disagreement for disagreement, like that's also very unhealthy. But when if you have a point to share, you should feel comfortable that you're gonna be valued for having the right intent to, to make the company better. Yeah. Well, you know, you s sometimes hear from entrepreneurs that if they knew everything um, at the beginning of their journey, that they knew at the end, right, all the, all the mistakes, and you know, w were aware of how much they didn't know, they never would have gotten started in the first place. Like, you know, sitting where you are, having kind of lived this journey, would you ever do it again when you even gotten started? I, the point is very valid. I would absolutely do it again. It's been such an incredible journey. Yeah. Um, but it's a very valid question whether if I knew, I, of course I would do it again now because the thing, the story <laughs> for the most part ended pretty well. But if I was on year, on year 20 of PeaceWorks and the next 20, 10 years were the same as the 10 years, that's a better question. And I think I would do it again because I've always chosen things that I'm passionate about, that I care about, that really I love doing. And so part of life is finding things that you're passionate about and finding that meaning. And then if you're passionate, you're gonna work harder at it and you're gonna get better at it. And regardless of whether where you land, that journey is gonna be so fulfilling. So I think I would do it again, uh, even if it, hadn't ended with the financial success. By the way, the interesting thing is, right now I look at PeaceWorks sometimes as like, well, you know, it was a failure because those 10 years we went, we never broke $2 million in sales. Like it was from 33,000 to 226,000 to 660,000 to 860,000. And then I, I don't remember perfectly the rest, but it was around a million, a million two, a million, a million four, like back and forth, and then we got to two million, back to one million. But those first 10 years, I didn't break two million, and I was hovering around one or two, and barely eking by, like sometimes I couldn't make payroll for others, so I had to skip my payroll. I'm sorry, I would have not been able to pay, I always paid everybody their salary, but I had to skip my payroll uh, in order to make theirs, and it was, it was difficult. But if you had asked me then, before Kind was born, if I was enjoying what I was doing, I'm like, I'm loving it. And if I was successful, I thought I was the most successful person in the world. Maybe not in the world, but 
I did not consider myself less successful. And I would get invited because of the concept of PeaceWorks to things, like I was invited to the World Economic Forum and I was at Davos with all these people and I knew I didn't belong there, but there was no, in terms of financial success or anything like that, I, I knew that I had snuck by, but there was no part of me that wished that I was doing somebody else's job. I loved what I was doing. I was probably the most passionate person in that group and people could sense that I loved what I was doing and they were drawn to help me on my mission and when I started One Voice because it was always authentic. So I think whatever job you're doing, make sure that you're finding within your remit the things that you want to do in your professional growth and talk to each other about how you achieve that because you're gonna be a much more effective leader at standard if you are passionate and enjoying what you're doing. And yeah. by the way, it's a commitment to excellence. It's, you know, anytime I interview people are like, well, I don't wanna be doing sales or I don't, that's not what it is about. It's about whatever you do, doing it with excellence, with a, the best you can. Yeah. One, one last thing I'm gonna say, like, uh, well, maybe not one last, but <laughs> uh, like, the reason why Kind has succeeded a lot is because we have that obsession with excellence. Like we don't cut corners. And in our industry, it's so easy to, all right, just add that sugar, just dump down the product, the consumer won't notice. So as long as you break through that mediocrity, you break through and you win. So if you have a commitment to excellence, as I sense that you guys do at Standard, I think you can continue winning because interestingly, a lot of the rest of the world is filled with, let me just do, make it good enough. And that, then the person that does it with, let me do the best I can is gonna always win. Yeah. How has being a magician made you a, a better businessman? Um, I'm waiting for us to do the magic there. I don't know if you've I, noticed. I keep looking here, we're, that's we're, what we're, I came we're, here for. We're getting there. Um, <laughs> uh, when you do magic, First of all, you learn a lot about human psychology, like you understand how people are looking and you, you learn how to read the room. Uh, you have to be very fast on your feet. You have to develop comfort with audiences and presence, it develops self-confidence. It's just thousands of things. Can I say about your daughter? Mm -hmm. Your daughter, Pippa, is a magician, as a fellow magician, and she's, uh, I've taught her a couple of things and she's a lot of fun too to see, but you know, you see she's got that presence and that energy and it's really fun to watch. That's so nice. He, he, she, she has learned magic from Dan and- Well, also from others, but- Yeah, but-, uh, but Jenny's like, oh, <laughs> Dan, dude. Her most famous tutor. Um, anyway, but uh, will, 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 you, uh, will you share some magic with us? I thought you'd never ask. You, 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 get to now, you get to now see talents Dan has that neither David nor I have. So you can decide. David uh, told you that when I was a kid in Mexico, I started doing magic and my uncle said, you know, I have a name for you. Instead of Danny, which in Mexico they called me Danny, there was a great magician named Houdini, so you'll be Houdani. So it was the great Houdani. <laughs> That's not the funny part. Uh, <laughs> the funniest part was that I had a partner, his name was Jaime, kind of like Jamie in the US. He was, he's Jaime, and he said, well, what am I gonna be? And we decided, he decided that his name was gonna be Hu Jaime, which <laughs> makes no sense in the world because Houdini, Houdani, but Hu Jaime doesn't <laughs> make any sense. But it was so nonsensical that it actually stuck, and to this day, his friends and I call him Hu Jaime. <laughs> um, so, look, I'm gonna need three victims. Uh, <laughs> And I will choose one of the victims, and then that victim will choose somebody else, and then Jen, you'll choose somebody else, just so that it's <laughs> completely randomized. So I'm gonna feel a little bit about the energy and get a feeling, what we're gonna perform, this is not magic tricks, it is not magic, it's a field of magic called mentalism. So you need to be comfortable with me getting inside your brain. If you're not comfortable, please let me know. But I, I wanna feel a little bit, I cannot select you, Tom, because I know you. So, um, everybody's scared, like. <laughs> these guys, like, please do not. 
we, we are not insured for having skin inside your brain. Tandy. Tandy, can you help me? Sure. Please go. Uh. Um, so, Tandy, you can stand here. And uh, Jen, you piss, pick somebody else, whoever you want. <laughs> What's your name? Hamilton. Hamilton. Um, and Hamilton and Tandy, you together do a do a team do a Hatu Harba, rock paper scissors. Do, do, rock, rock <laughs> scissors paper. I don't know how to do rock paper. Um, Seriously? Just no. okay. So he gets disqualified. <laughs> you choose anybody you want. No. Oh. <laughs> Your name again is Hamilton, Hamilton and Tandy. I know Hamilton. What, what's your name? Lynn. Lynn, I'm there. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Okay, nice so um, we'll start. <laughs> Lynn. Um, yes, We'll start with you picking a card. Just say stop anytime today. Say stop, stop. whenever you want. So you're going to take that card yes, when you say stop. Okay, say stop. Sorry. Is this the one you want? Yes, okay, sir. Okay, take it. Don't show it to me. Are you, have you memorized that? Don't show it to others if you can. So it'd be a, there's an element of surprise. It's but. in your heart. Okay. Now put it back in here. Now shuffle the cards. But don't forget that number, okay? Or that card, because uh, we'll we'll do that next. Um, Hamilton, would you like a number or a color? A color. A color. Okay. Look at my eyes. Okay. I'm sorry. 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 I need to just explain something to you. I have this board, and it has these little things over which I can close each of the things. I'm gonna put. I'm going to read their minds and, and write it here, and then the, they are going to fill up the, the board here, okay? So um, you said color, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, look at my eyes. Close your eyes. Open your eyes again. Close your eyes. Now imagine a white screen. Imagine a white screen. Mm -hmm. And on the white screen, you s it switches to that color. No, it didn't. Okay, look at my eyes. Close your eyes. White screen. Mm -hmm. Now change that screen to black. Don't choose black or white. Now change that screen to white. Mm -hmm. Now full black, take all the white out. Mm -hmm. Now full white, take all the white out. Now imagine that with a black marker, you just write down the name of the color on the white screen. I think I got it. I'm going to block it here. And I want you to write down what color you have chosen. Build the suspense. <laughs> Take your time. Perfect. OK. So he chose blue. OK? So Tandy? A number. Can you think of a number between zero and a hundred? Okay. Lift your head a little bit. Look at my eyes. Lift a little bit. <laughs> I need to see your eyes. <laughs> Close your eyes. Now imagine that you're walking through the forest. You're walking through the forest. Everything is green. Mm -hmm. Everything is green. And as you walk, you get to a big tree that has a big white sign, a big white board. And on the board, there is a number written in black letters. OK, imagine the white screen all over, just white, everything white. Now think of the number again. OK, 
Okay, that's my prediction of what you will write. Now, please write down the number here. It's okay. <laughs> they, I've already written it. <laughs> huh? Okay, 45. All right. Uh, your name again was? Lynn. Lynn. So, Lynn, do you remember your card? Yes, I do. Can I have my cards back? Yes, you may. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, look at my eyes. <laughs> close your eyes. Open your eyes. Look, open your eyes a little more. Okay, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Okay, now, imagine that you're in the North Pole. It's very, very cold. Mm -hmm. It's all white. Everywhere you look is white. Everywhere you look is white. All of a sudden, you get into an igloo. You walk into that igloo, and there's a table, and on that table, there's one card. There's one playing card, and it's the card. I see that it's red, but I don't see. You need to be more defined. Okay, just, I think it's a number, but I don't see. So just think of the number right now. Just isolate the number. Okay, and now think whether it's a diamond or a heart. Okay, so now what I need you to do is, sorry, put the, um, what you call it, the card number there. And the, the now, card the symbol. yeah, the, the number and the symbol. Okay. So, David, what is the first color? What is it? Blue. Can you take this thing off? Blue. Blue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's your name? What's your name? Shadil. Shadil, what's the number? 45. Can you take this thing off? <laughs> 45. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sir, what's your name? Jake. Jake, what's this? Five of diamond, take it up. <laughs> okay. Can you hand it thank you. Um, Lynn, thank you so much. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to try something else. David, you have a few minutes. Do you mind if I try something else? Sure. I felt, uh, by the way, don't, I, don't run away. No. <laughs> I, I felt, thank you. I think you can go. Thank you, sir. I felt. You can't, no, no, stay here. You can't always do this, but with you guys, I felt there's a possibility to do something else. So I'm going to try, if you're willing, mm -hmm. I'm going to go inside your mind. Would you mm. be okay if I try that? <laughs> no, no, that was, a, I just, that was just like this. Now I'm going deep, uh, but you need to welcome me. Are you okay with that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll start with you, okay? All right, Tandy, come here. Have you and I ever met? No. Okay, have you and I ever met? No. Okay. Um, you, have to, you have to welcome me, otherwise, because we're going to go back into your past. Okay. It doesn't always work, but when it works, it's magical. Hmm. Okay, look up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Close your eyes. Now, we need to do wavelength synchronization. So white, imagine everything is white, everything is white. Now, everything is black. Now, everything is red, put everything red. David, stop doing it, you too, because you're <laughs> <laughs> freaking, I'm getting inside. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna you guys you don't know. <laughs> like, look at me, white, close your eyes, white, black, blue, everything blue, everything white. I got it. I'm there. I'm there. Okay. Now go back. Go back a few years. Go further back. Go further back. Go to your earliest memories. Go to your childhood. Go to your childhood that you don't even remember. Go to when you're four years old. Try. Try. I know you think you can't, but all of us have something there. Let's see if you can come five years old, six years old, seven years old. Find something there. Where were you? 
raised. Walk around where you were raised. Imagine where you were. Walk around there. Walk in and out of your house and around your neighborhood. See, I see water. I see a body of water. I don't know if it's the ocean or a lake or a river. I think there's a lake. I see a lake. Is there a body of water near where you live? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I see a lot of children playing. I see a big number of kids. It's Are you with friends or you have so many kids in your family? I, I'm I, one of six children, so there were always kids at my house. And, and with your friends and where? Yes. Were you always. Amish? <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with Amish. You did? Yes. I see <laughs> outfits. But I was I not Amish. You were not Amish, <laughs> but you grew up with Amish? Yes. And you're with a friend, there's a boy who's Amish. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> I see hot dogs. Stop. <laughs> I see a fair. I see, I see an Amish fair or a. There's a lot of food. There's a lot of junk food. I see hot dogs. <laughs> there's a boy. In your mind, signal me if there's a boy who's Amish. Don't tell me the name. Send me the name. Shh. <laughs> Shh. I'm not getting it. Uh, open your eyes. <laughs> Close your eyes. Amish, mm -hmm. lake, sh 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 Shane Baylor, Shane, ba Shane, ba sh Byler. Shane Byler, <laughs> who's that? A very good friend of mine growing up, ex-Amish, who became non-Amish. So. You can open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell us what I saw? I'm not sure. Um, There's some, how much of it was distance. totally like Daniel? You're totally <laughs> wrong. No, I mean, because uh, you can't get it open. In Indiana, uh, with Amish people, I went to school with them till the eighth grade when they graduated. And Shane Byler was a very good friend of mine who was Amish, stopped being Amish, and uh, his family left. Why did I keep seeing hot dogs? Um, because the Grable Country Fair. Well, and I ate hot dogs. That was my favorite food growing mm. up. Mm. Um, <laughs> So I had a lot of hot dogs, yeah, and Grable Country Days was the fair that we would go to every year. Yes. <laughs> Who wants to sit down? <laughs> Should we try with him or no? Yes. Do we have time for one more? Sure, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> We've all want to know what is in Hamilton's mind. What was your name again? Hamilton. Hamilton. Open your eyes. <laughs> you you have to let me in. Okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. Close your eyes. Imagine that you're running. You're hiking up a mountain. You're hiking up and up and up. One step, another step, another step, another step. Stop. Turn around. Hike down. Stop, get stuck, stop. Turn around, hike up. Stop, stay there. Open your eyes. You have to let me in. Let's yeah, say one more. I don't hike a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's just to get your imagination to get, oh, okay, okay, fine. Yeah. What is your favorite activity? Open your eyes. What is your favorite? Uh, tennis. Tennis, okay, perfect. Look at me. Close your eyes. Now you're in a tennis court. Mm -hmm. You hit the ball. Mm -hmm. It comes back. Hit the ball. Mm -hmm. It comes back. Hit the ball. It's mm -hmm. out. Serve the ball. Mm -hmm. Okay, stay there. Now go back a few years. 
see a big party. Recent party. Big party. Feels like a lot of celebrities. Um, okay, keep going back. Go back to further. Um, I see kind of like a jungly uh, third world feeling. I feel like third world connection. Go further back. Go further back. I'm, I'm going to touch you, okay? Mm -hmm. Go back to your childhood. I see darkness. I see like dark halls. It looks like a gigantic castle. You're with a girl. You're reading a lot of books. Mary? Mm -hmm. You're reading a lot of books. There's a lot of books in some dark hallways and castles and big rooms. Could you can open your eyes. Did I get anything you right? Did, or was it yes. Yeah, my sister's name is Mary, and uh, we lived in a big uh, house. So in start again. Sorry. Uh, my sister's name is Mary, and uh, when we were growing up, uh, we lived in a, a big, strange house in Ireland at one point, and all we did was go upstairs every night and read books every night. You want to so. try something more, or is that good? No, no, no that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It's a lot for me. <laughs> That's amazing. So the, the, the answer to how it helps being a magician in business is that he can read your mind, <laughs> which, which is super useful. Can I tell um, you a story? I, I, on the closing dinner of when we did this transaction, uh, a strategic transaction with an investor, uh, I started doing magic and I did mentalism. And Byron Trott, who was my counterpart, was really, really upset. And he's like, I, he, he really thought that I had gotten into his brain. And then I had like, <laughs> that I had like and I'm like, Baron, it's just, I, I was just teasing you. But like, uh. till now, he thinks like, ah, oh, that's why you got such a good deal, Daniel. Um, I want to be sensitive to time, but love to take one or two questions, you know, from the audience, you know, while, while, you know, while Dan is here. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get everybody out of here. Hi, um, uh, thank you for your story about the guy that was mean to the waiter. Um, I was wondering how... Was that you? <laughs> <laughs> I can't see you. Oh, hi, uh, Sean from Standard. Uh, hi. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering how a culture based on kindness to other people pays off in the success of your business. Um, first of all, a culture based on kindness is not based for the business to succeed. It's, and I will address that, but like we never started with that inspiring kindness because we thought we'd sell more kind bars. If I, in fact, if you saw the first five or 10 years of our history and you go, look, we never talked about our social mission. We talked about the products being uh, at our kindness mission. We talked about our helpful, delicious products. And because in my Peace Rocks years, I had felt that what you said about the product needs to lead, and I was a little bit concerned that the social mission could get in the way. We pursued the social mission with a lot of passion, but we didn't even talk about it. And only later did we realize that we had over shifted the pendulum way too far in the other direction, and we should be proud of talking about it. And I do think that kindness is a small contributor to our success. I think our primary contributor to our success is that the products are healthful and delicious and they provide a product that people want. That's 90 or 99% of the reason that people buy them. But the commitment we have to foster kindness 
I think is an additional reason to achieve loyalty among our consumers and our different stakeholders and for people to appreciate the brand. But a culture based on kindness in any company creates that incredible glue that helps us all be there for each other. So that when tough things happen, you know that inside you have each other's back and there's no divisions or politics. You are there for each other. But above all, a culture based of kindness makes this a better world, makes everybody more fulfilled. And the magic about kindness is that it's what we nerds like to call a net happiness aggregator. And what it means is that if you're kind to me, you make my day, I feel better, but you also feel better because when you help somebody, you feel better about yourself. So it's one of those few things in life that when the act of kindness happens, all of a sudden happiness increases for both sides. So the more kindness we have, the more that we all feel good about it. And the interesting thing about kindness is that kindness is an action that requires strength and courage. People don't realize that because they confuse kindness with being nice. And you can be nice and be passive. Just don't cause problems. But to be kind, you have to be active. You have to solve those problems. You can be nice and not bother people. You can be nice and not bully people. But if you're kind, you stand up to protect those people being bullied. If you're kind, you stretch that hand to the needy person. So kindness requires action. You can be nice and be polite, but kindness requires honesty, and honesty requires courage and strength. Kindness requires enormous strength. When you're walking down New York City and somebody has a bad day, and we walk away and turn because we don't want to bother them, you're still being nice. You're trying not to bother them. But if you want to be kind, you look at their eyes and you signal to them that you see their humanity. And kindness requires enormous amount of strength. And the more that we have it, the less that we'll have divisions and acrimony and, and stuff like what happened to my father. And I think I do want to connect to the reason why the company is kind is in honor of my dad because he was a Holocaust survivor, and he taught us from an early age about what he went through in the concentration camp, and it was really, really horrible. And he, he made sure to tell us all these horrible things, but he also told us about the moments where people from the other side, not necessarily kind people, did the kind thing. Not like when they sh saw his humanity and, and took acts of courage to save his life, and his family's life. And so that's why we want to try to inspire kindness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is my perfect what? Magic. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm available for birthday parties, <laughs> weddings, and... Uh...